In this video I'll go through the single fluid equations, so show how they can be derived from the two fluid equations. Uh, and the two fluid equations were in turn derived from the kinetic equation. So in a previous video I showed that you can take moments of, of the kinetic equation for plasmas and you can derive equations for the, the density and the, the momentum and you can go further and drive the equations for the, the energy or the temperature of these, of these species. And these are equations for each species separately, so equations for the electrons, um, a separate set of equations for the ions, and they all have the same, the same form, uh, but of course different masses or different, um, different charges, uh, different collision terms, for example, uh, which we didn't cover then, but we'll cover later. And so they all have a, a density equation, which looks like like this, so we have a uh, divergence of some kind of flow with a flow velocity. And then here we have, in this case, no, no sources or sinks. And what we're going to do in this, in this video is label these, so give a species label alpha. So alpha is going to be, so alpha is the species. So for example, um, electrons or, or ions, so E or, or ions, or it might be some, some other charges we might have. Uh, but here we'll just consider electrons and a and singly charged charged ion like hydrogen. Um, and then here n is the the density, just to remind you, um, in sort of particles per cubic meter. And then u is a, a fluid velocity, so in in meters per second. Okay. And then we have a momentum equation, which describes this this fluid flow. And so we had a description for the the trace change of the the flux. Again, u alpha. So here P is the pressure tensor, which of course depends on different species. Um, we have a charge Q alpha, a mass M alpha. Um, the electric and magnetic fields of course don't depend on the, on the species, they're just, they're just functions of time and space. And then we have a, a friction term R alpha, which depends on the collisions with, with, within the species and within, with other species. And these of course are coupled to, to Maxwell's equations. So here we have um, a current so J is the, is the current density, and this of course is just the, the sum over all the species of the, the charge of each species and its flux, so N times, times U alpha. And this gives the total flow of charge um, at any point in space. Um, I've given this label Q bar, uh, this is the, the charge per volume, charge density. Uh, it's usually called rho, but I used that for mass density in, a previous, in previous videos, so I'll try and stick with a different symbol. Um, and this is just the sum of all the species of their charge times their density. So it's the, the total net charge within a, a, a volume. And now we have um, a couple set of equations. Uh, so you need to make here some assumption for, for what happens to the pressure. So it might be a, a further equation for the temperature, or it might be a, an, an approximation. Um, but for now, we will look at these equations as, as they have most of most of what we're interested in for now. Um, so we start by making some approximations. So we start initially by assuming that the motion is slow compared to the speed of light, um, and so we can remove this term, so the Maxwell term, from, from this equation. So we assume this term is neglected, and this is the term that gives the so displacement current. Um, this gives electromagnetic waves, so things like, like light waves, and so we're assuming that the the velocities, of, like thermal velocities of the particles, are much less than than speed of light. So it's a non-relativistic uh, relativistic theory. And we're assuming that the wave speeds, so so particularly the, the phase speeds, are also much less than than c. So everything's moving slowly compared to speed of light. Then then we can make this, this approximation. Um, and this is done by, by setting um, epsilon naught to zero. So formally you set so epsilon naught as limit to zero. Um, and this has also similar consequences in, in this equation, so for the, the charge density. So letting epsilon naught go to zero. And what this does um, is we have to rearrange this equation and just write this as epsilon naught divergence of E is this, this net charge so it's the charge density and this in the same limit goes to zero so as you let epsilon naught go to zero this goes to zero and this is this is quasi-neutrality 
And so by doing this, we also remove some other waves. So we, uh, we don't allow the, the plasma to have plasma oscillations or Langmuir waves. Uh, we've removed the, the charge separation that's, that's needed for, for a uh, plasma oscillation. And so we, we assume that the, plasma, that the frequencies we're interested in, these frequencies, or like the, the wave frequencies we're looking at, must be much, much less than, than the plasma frequency. And we must also assume that we're looking at phenomena which are, are long compared to the Debye length. So we must have that the, the wavelengths of the waves we're looking at must be much bigger than, the, than lambda d, so the Debye. Because on, on length scales smaller than the Debye length, we can have um, net charge imbalance. Whereas we're here, we're, we're assuming that on average, the charge imbalance is very small. Um, note that this doesn't necessarily mean that the divergence of E is zero. So divergence of E is not equal, not necessarily equal to zero. Um, this is saying that this net charge is very small. Um, and so there's a subtle difference. Um, so it essentially means that the the difference in, in charge densities is extremely small compared to the, the net density. So, um, so this charge in balance divided by say the, the density of, of electrons, for example, times their charge Q electron, um, is much less than much less than one. So it's a very small charge imbalance, um, so that this limit, epsilon naught divergence V goes to zero. And so this is a, a slow frequency approximation, so we've neglected the speed of light, we've neglected the the plasma frequency, and we're already starting to, to limit how small scales we can look at. Okay, so this makes some initial simplifications. So this removes essentially this equation here. Um, this, there's a, a link between say, this equation and, and this one now. Um, because if you, if you look at what's left in this, well, I'll use a different color. So you take the equation that's left here um, you can now see that if you take divergence of this, so divergence of, of the curl of B is equal to zero, and this means that, that divergence of J is equal to zero. And that's consistent with, with this approximation, this quasi-neutrality. Because if there's no divergence of, of current, then there's no charge accumulation, um, and the charge imbalance remains remains small. So this, this immediately removes one of these equations that you have this constraint that the divergence of current is, is zero. Um, uh, but we still have a set of equations for, for each species. So we have one of these for each, uh, for electrons, one for ions. And so we can combine these and make some further approximations to get to, to single fluid and then ideal MHD. So first one to look at the, the mass density. And here the idea is that the, the mass of the ions is much, much larger than the mass of the electrons. And so therefore, if you want to, to work out the, the average mass um, of, the, of the plasma, it's essentially dominated by the ions. Um, so if you have mass density rho, um, this is just that's the mass of ions times the density of ions plus the mass of electrons plus the sum over all our species. Um, the idea here is we're assuming this goes it's very small. So, so here we're neglecting the electron mass. So electron mass goes to zero. And this will be used also in, in the momentum equation for the for the uh, electrons when we drive the single fluid equations. So we're neglecting electron mass, and this means that the, the plasma density equation is just is just the the iron uh, equation. So we end up with just d rho by dt. And now this is the flow of iron. So it's the iron velocity here is equal to zero. And this is essentially the same as the the fluid equation for the mass density. Um, I've done this here by neglecting the, the electron mass. So the momentum equation works in a quite similar way because the, 
Again, the electron mass is neglected, so the momentum is dominated by the uh, by the ions. So we add add the momentum equations. So we add the ele the electron and ion equations, and when we add up the terms from the uh, the time derivative, for example, we end up with a, an ion mass times the ion flux plus the electron mass times the electron flux. E plus all the other stuff, and this, because we're setting the, the electron uh, mass to zero, this all disappears too. What adds up, if we look, look back at the, the momentum equation, so here on this, this side we only keep the ion terms because they're the, the dominant part of, of these sums. Um, here the, the pressure equations add up, so the electrons have a, a non-zero uh, pressure that we have to include. Um, the charges here, so when you include, for example, the electric field, if the sum over the charge times the, the density is just this, uh, this charge density, so if we add up all the species charge times, times density, this goes to zero. So this first term, the electric field term cancels out. And what we end up here is a, is a current term. So we add up all the velocities, um, and then often these will either cancel out. If there are frictions between the species, these will one will have a minus sign, one will have a plus, and not cancel. So we can go down to to the momentum equation, and what we end up with is a term where we've kept only the, the ion terms, and so we end up with a d by dt. Again, this is a, this is the mass density here. This is this is rho. Now the, the pressure terms add up, so we end up with a electron pressure plus an ion pressure term. There's both tensors in here. Um, and then on the right hand side, the, the ion and electron terms combine. On the side you end up with a J cross B. So you add up the velocity of the different, different charges crossed with the uh, magnetic field. And the, ele the electric field term cancels out. And you may have a term in here, but, but usually the, the friction between species often cancels out. Okay, so that's the, the momentum equation uh, we're going to use. And you can see already from, from earlier lectures that, that here, if you're in stationary steady state, these, these terms will disappear. This term, if you make enough an approximations, this becomes the, the pressure, and you start to see the equilibrium appearing, so J cross B is, is grad P. So we can make this approximation um, once we realize that, that these terms here, um, these contain the higher moments, so this contains the, the temperature equation, for example. But if, there's a, if there are enough collisions, um, so in a collisional regime, so if, you're, if you're frequent enough collisions so that we have a, the time scales of the oscillations are, are much uh, longer than the collision time, um, so we have frequencies omega is much much less than the, than the collision time. Uh, lengths, wavelengths, which are much much longer than the the mean field path. Um, then this these pressure tensors become an isotropic pressure. And for a single fluid MHD, uh, we assume that. So the, the electron pressure and the ion pressure are equal. So for a single fluid, so we set that PE is equal to PI. And this only is only true if, if the electron and ion temperatures are the same. So ITE is equal to TI. And there, there's a time scale for electrons and ions to collide and, and exchange energy. And that time is, is longer than, than is needed for, for this collisional regime approximation. And so this is a, a stronger assumption on, on the collision rate, and it requires that the the wavelengths, so the mean free path, um, divided by a typical wavelengths we're looking at, sort of this could be L, like some kind of typical length scale or, or wavelength of a wave, this must be much less than the square root of the mass ratio. Because that's the, the kind of time scale that this takes for um, 
uh, for collisions to exchange energy between electrons and ions. But if, if these assumptions on a strong collisional uh, regime are true, then then this term can be just replaced with with a pressure. And then in in ideal MHT, for example, this is assumed to be adiabatic. So you just assume that that p over over rho to the gamma is constant. And that provides a, a closure equation um, for for these for these equations. So so far we've assumed low frequencies, uh, we've neglected any charge um, accumulation, so we've assumed cost neutrality. Um, here we've made a, a strong assumption on, on collisionals, uh, collisional regime, um, even more so when we neglect the difference between the electron and ion temperatures. Um, the final set of assumptions we can get from looking at Ohm's law, and Ohm's law is essentially just the electron momentum equation. So if we take the momentum equation and we set the electron mass to zero, consistent with what we, what we did earlier, so what's left over is the, the divergence of the, the electron pressure tensor. And this is the uh, Lorentz force. So we have an E times an NE. Now we have the electric field plus UE across the magnetic field, um, plus the friction term, RE. And this is coming from the collision, so it's essentially the resistivity. Well, it'll turn out to be because this is the, the collisions between the electrons and the, and the ions. And so the, all the terms involving um, time derivative of the, the electron velocity have gone, gone to zero because we've assumed electron mass has gone to zero. Now we've assumed that the PE, the pressure tensor, has gone to a scalar pressure if we're in the collisional regime. Um, and now we're just going to rewrite the electron velocity so we have the, the because we have j is just the sum of all the, the charges times their their velocity. So we have that this is e n times u i minus e n u e. There's n e and n i. And so we just rearrange this and write that u e is just u i minus j over e n because we assume that n i is equal to n e from quasi-neutrality. So then we substitute this expression for u e into, into here. So this, this term here goes into, into there. And we end up with a term which is so gradient of electron pressure on, on this side. An e n, so set up with an e um, plus u i cross b. That's the iron iron flow cross with the magnetic field. Um, and then we end up with a term from from this current. So we end up with a minus. So this e n cancels with that e n. So we end up with a minus j cross b. And then we have the the r e term at the end, of course. So plus RE. So this is usually written uh, by rearranging for, for this term, so E plus V cross B. So this is So the this term at the beginning, is this well this term on the right first right side here, this is the whole term. Uh, this next term is the electron diamagnetic term. And on the and this last term here is just due to is due to friction, um, and this this term here on the left on the left hand side this is the ideal MHD Ohm's law. So if all the terms on the right hand side go to zero um, or assume to be small, then we have we recover the ideal MHD um, Ohm's law. And so, for example, the collision rate must not be so high that this ends up being being large. So we need enough collisions that we're in the collisional regime. Um, and we can make the approximations we made, made earlier on things like the pressure tensor. Um, but if collisions are too high, then this will start to become significant. So there will be the resistive MHD. Um, so for ideal MHD to work, 
the collisions have to be high but not too high um, so that we can still neglect this term and for, in order for these terms to be small um, we essentially need that the uh, the frequencies are much smaller than, than the iron gyro radius so we need that, that all frequencies are much less than the iron cyclotron and we need that length scales are much bigger than the iron gyro, uh, gyro radius so I call that RL So that, that enables us to neglect these terms on the right-hand side. So if you if you keep these terms, you end up with, with length scales, so phenomena on length scales which are comparable to the iron uh, cyclotron uh, frequency and, and radius. So these can be important for some phenomena like uh, magnetic reconnection. Uh, but for ideal MHD, we assume that, that the phenomena we're looking at are, are slow and of large length scales, and that lets, that lets us recover the formula we had, we had a while ago, so E plus V cross B. So that gets the ideal MHD um, Ohm's law. So these are the main assumptions which have, have been made. Um, you've seen them before in a, in a simpler kind of way, but this shows more systematically how you get which terms in the equations disappear when you make different assumptions. And at the end you have um, a simplification for the, the Ohm's law, you end up with a, a simpler, simpler momentum equation. So one momentum equation for the, the whole plasma, if you make this assumption that the, the separate pressures um, equilibrate, which you know, makes this, this approximation on the collisions. Um, by making an adiabatic approximation, you can get an equation for the, the pressure in terms of just essentially the density equation. Um, and so this labels a, another simplification. And the, of course, the, the mass equation just is is the iron, the iron dynamics. And that's it. That gets you ideal MHD from the kinetic, from the two fluid equations, and then ultimately from the kinetic equations. Okay. Thank you.